not sure if it's next week or the week after for a while and then he'll be gone again but uh i'm still subbing so uh, i thought i've been uh, contemplating i've been contemplating what i might do for the conference in salem in january I've been asked to preach there and i've been thinking about the passage in john 17 where jesus says glorify your son that your son may glorify you that's been on my mind as a possible conference text i believe uh, i believe um pastor matt postup is going to be in the old testament so i thought i'd try to think of something in the new but in light of all of that i was reminded of a passage in jude and i want to call your attention to jude And I've been reflecting on it as well. I know everyone here was with us many years ago when we taught through Jude. I love the little book of Jude. It, it, it's absolutely my favorite little book uh, in the New Testament. I remember choosing this in homiletics class to teach and uh, in seminary. So my love for this book goes back a long way. But what, what we're interested in uh, primarily today is verses 24 and 25, really verse 25. But I'm going to kind of get a run at it as Jude ends the book. To him who's able, I'm, I'm reading the NIV, I left my Schofield at home this morning, to him who's able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior, be glory. Be glory. Majesty, power, authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now. Amen. Amen. So, Father, help us as we contemplate your glory. May it always be before our minds and our lives and our ministries. That God be glorified. It's his name. Amen. Yeah. Um, someone has called Jude 25 the greatest doxology in the Bible. I, I think John 17 is. <laughs> Pardon me. It's my allergies again. Although I do have a new spray, maybe it'll help. I hope. Um, I think it's John 17, but they're in a close race, being the greatest doxology in the Bible. And as you've heard me teach before, when we were in the book of Job, and you've heard me say in other times as well, uh, it, it's a doxology, not a benediction. Some preach this section as if it's a benediction. But there's a great difference between a doxology and a benediction. And I think everybody here knows that. But I'll just repeat it for those online that may not, because we use these words and don't always think about them. A benediction is a prayer for God's blessing to come down on us. The benediction that we used to say every Sunday in our church at the end of the service at Tabernacle Baptist Church where I grew up was from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Now, that was one second verse of the Bible I knew because we said it every Sunday, which kind of drilled in us every single Sunday. Now, that is a benediction. It's called the ironic benediction 
And actually, the oldest text we have on the Old Testament is this verse. They just found it. It's hundreds of years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they simply found this on a, a little, I forgot exactly what it was. It was written on something, not paper or parchment, but they found it. To their surprise, the Aaronic benediction is hundreds of years older than uh, any other text we have, and it's found on that, I can't think of it, was, I think it was on silver or something like that, piece of silver, very small. Now, when we come to the end of Jude, this is not a benediction. You might think it is because it's at the end of the book. And in fact, one writer even called it the benediction, but it's not. It's not asking God to bless us. It's not a prayer for God's blessing to come down on us. That's the right thing to do. We should do that, but that's not what this text is doing. It's praise going up from us to the Lord. That's what a doxology is. It's a brief formula for expressing praise or glory to God. If you look at the word doxology, doxa means glory, and the ology part comes from logos, a word. So it's, it's a, a benediction, as one said, goes goes, um, a benediction goes uh, down from God to you, a blessing uh, goes up to God. So you bless God in a doxology. God's being praised, and God is being praised in this doxology for his benediction to us, <laughs> his blessings to us. And now there's a song, Praise God from all whom blessings flow. Praise him, you know that you know that. Now that is kind of a combination, right? It's a we're praising God for all, all the blessings that have come our way, and yet that's what's going on here. If you remember when we taught the Book of Jude years and years ago, as Bill Hickson's outline. In the first two verses, I'll, I'll just mention this outline to just help you follow, we have a description of the true church in times of apostasy. Jude was writing because false teachers had come in. He was going to write about the common salvation, as you know, but circumstances demanded a different approach at that time. Apparently, this warning could not wait. This warning could not wait. A false teaching was too dangerous for Jude to go on in teaching as if it wasn't there. And so Jude wanted to have a very positive message, but he had to change that approach because of what was happening. But in the early verse, he describes the true church in the first two verses in times of apostasy. It's beloved, it's kept, and it's called. He's very clear about these people. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, a brother of James, to those who've been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the prayer that goes with that. Now, we must know the difference between friend or foe. That's why soldiers have uniforms. And that's why teams... Uh, ball teams have uniforms. You have to know the difference between friend and foe. That is critically important in sports. It's critically in sport, important in military welfare because if you don't know the difference between friend and foe and you don't have ways to uh, ID them, you can be guilty of friendly fire. That's what they call it in the military when the tanks or the artillery or uh, a barrage of rifle fire hits one of your own. And so when you mistake a friend for an enemy. Now, we can't, afford, we can't afford to hold our fire from the enemy. 
but we must be careful to know who the enemy is and who our friends are. So this description of the true church in times of apostasy is critically, critically, critically important. And the book of Jude is so clear on this, and may God help us to just really enjoy that. If you're saved, you're one of the called, and you're, you're loved and you're kept. So that's, that's very important. And the kept means we're kept from ourselves rather as well as from others. The second part of the book uh, it expands this, and it's really in verses 3 to 23, the duties of the true church in times of apostasy. We have responsibilities. Because of the danger the church is in, these duties are essential. Desertion is taking place. There are some that have left true teaching. So Jude gives different duties, and he introduces this word beloved three times, or my NIV calls it dear friends. And our duties are described in verses 3 to 23. One, we're to fight. We're not to be passive. Truth never changes. Heresy always does. We are to fight, standing upon uh, that which is true and which is being assaulted and which the adversary desires to take away. It's a fight as to defend it and to retain it. It's very clear that's what he wants. Dear friends or beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge and to contend, to contend, to, to contend for the faith. It means fight for the faith. For certain men whose condemnation were, was written long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They're godless men who change the grace of God into a license of immorality and deny our Lord, uh, deny Jesus Christ our sovereign and Lord. And so there, there is this responsibility to fight, beloved fight. Uh, I have met the former president of Northland Baptist College a couple of times. He was in Florida and, and was a major speaker when we were there and had our conference during COVID there. He's a delightful individual, very discerning man. And this is something he said somewhere, and I wrote it down. It's not what you teach so much as what you tolerate that determines where your school or church is going. Now, here's a man in his mid-80s. He's seen a lot. He saw his own school go down. Even though he would say things like this. But it's it, it's a very important thing. It's not what you teach so much as what you tolerate that determines whether your school or church, where your school or church is going. You can have good teaching, but if you tolerate looseness, you're going to go down. And so that's something to remember. You see, Jude could have just written about the common salvation. Let's be real positive. Let's emphasize what we all agree on or what we all what, all, what we all think we agree on, and that'll be enough. But Jude realized it wasn't enough. So he switched gears. He switched gears. And he began to expose, and he began to exhort. And so he realized this is a problem that is not going to go away without a battle. And so it's very, very important to grasp that thing. We have to fight. And Jude wanted that fight to take place. In verse 17, we need to remember. Beloved, remember. Some churches have no 
um, connection with the early church and what they taught and the, the, the New Testament and what the, Bi what the apostles taught. People don't know. And so he says, remember, 17, the words what the apostles of our Lord or told, they said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desire. These are the men who divide you, who follow natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. This is a clear verse for interpreting current events, current issues, from the lens of Scripture and the teachings and policies of the Apostle. Every New Testament writer warns of, the, of false teachers and false teaching. You've got to have those glasses on. You have to have that, that mindset that this is going to be a recurring problem. It's no fun to have a recurring problem. But sometimes you go through that. In our house, we've been going through plumbing problems. As soon as we get one fixed, another one happens. And it's just, it's just, we haven't had plumbing problems for years, but all of a sudden, <laughs> I think we've had four. And they've all come at different times. And so, uh, and, and churches can go along fine for a long time, and all of a sudden there's a bunch of problems. And, and the church is being pushed in this direction or that direction. So someone has to stand up and deal with it. You'd rather not deal. I, I'd rather not deal with plumbing problems. I, I don't particularly. I hate plumbing problems. And I usually call a plumber because I'm not much of a plumber, and uh, usually anything I fix is not fixed very long. But you, you, there's sometimes things happen and you can't ignore it. And that's what happened. That's what Jude is saying. And hopefully everybody has a passion to be positive and not be a heresy hunter, and enjoy that kind of thing. But uh, dealing with those kinds of things, uh, there's something wrong with us if that's our passion. There's, there's a pride that says, I'm right, you're wrong, and that kind of stuff. But Jude is teaching that every church has to have a, uh, a, a an alarm bell. Every church has to sometimes deal with things that they would rather not deal with. John MacArthur said, the evangelical movement isn't really very evangelical anymore. The typical evangelical leader today, now listen to this. This was written a long, this was stated a long time ago. The typical evangelical leader today is far more likely to express indignation at someone who calls for doctrinal clarity and accuracy than to firmly oppose another self-styled evangelical who actually is attacking some vital biblical truth. Yeah. He says, the evangelical movement isn't really very evangelical anymore. The typical evangelical leader today, he's talking about pastors and evangelists and college presidents, is far more likely to express indignation at someone who calls for doctrinal clarity and accuracy than to firmly oppose another self-styled evangelical who's actively attacking some vital biblical truth. And so discernment demands that where Scripture speaks with clarity, a hard line must be drawn. And all this woke craziness is one of the later, latest things, but you just, this is the line. We don't cross this. And if you don't like it and leave, I'm sorry, but it's not, we're not changing. So discernment demands that where Scripture speaks with clarity, a hard line must be drawn. I'm reading a book right now of a so-called gay Christian who is trying to defend gay marriage as biblical. He says he's born again, and, and as long as you're married, that's okay, and the church should get used to that and accept it and all of the rest of that stuff. He doesn't want to be promiscuous and all that. He believes as long as you got 
two people, that's good enough. Now, it's a very interesting book in some ways, but his hermeneutics and his theology is just awful. And he's making a, what he thinks is a strong case for his position so that everybody will come his way. Well, he got his parents to come his way, but he didn't get his church to come that way. They wouldn't stand for it. So it's, it's important for us. It's painful when people take positions and want others to come to that position and begin to advocate that kind of thing and others start caving in. It's painful to have to say, no, that's wrong. We love you, but that's wrong. So we fight for the faith. We're to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. And to we're to remember the words of the apostles and their warning ministry. I thank God for Harlan Osball. He had a warning ministry. And Jim Lusher's dad was our pastor in the American Baptist Church. The guy was tremendous blessing to us. He was a very gracious, kind. He, he's a hundred times kinder than me, a hundred times more thoughtful than me, a, a much better Christian in so many ways than I, I'll ever be in this life. But the American Baptist Church didn't have a strong warning ministry. And God brought into my life a man who had serious flaws, and, and that's good because I've got serious flaws, but he had a warning ministry, and I needed it. And so it's important, fight for the faith, contend for the faith, remember the words of the apostles. And so he's really hitting these things hard. And then the third beloved, or the third dear friends, but you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus to bring you to eternal life. So the church has duties, and those duties are uh, those duties are described in light of the dangers. The duties are described in light of the dangers. The dangers don't just fit uh, one part of this. The dangers are, are they're all over that middle part. When he's talking about duties, he's talking about duties in light of the dangers. So instead of a three-point outline of the book, the description of the church in time of apostasy, one to two, the duties of the church in times of apostasy, three to 23, we could go back and say the dangers, point three, of the church in times of apostasy, three and 23. Our duties go along with the dangers. And it's because of the dangers that we have to uh, be very concerned about our duties. Or we can do just what John MacArthur said we can't do. Uh, or, or, uh, and, and, and I understand that, sorry, not John MacArthur, but uh, uh, Dr. O, it's not what you teach so much as what you tolerate that determines where your school or church is going. So if you tolerate something that's wrong, that's where your church will be in 50 years. That wrong is going to take over. A little leaven leavens a whole lot, Paul said. And that's true in the areas of morality. Uh, it's it, it's true in, in 1 Corinthians 5. It's true in the areas of doctrine in the book of Galatians. Both are leaven, false doctrine, false living. So this epistle, this little epistle, was written when the battle was on and the problem was there. The dangers were manifesting themselves. And Jude stopped what he was going to write. You must do these things. You have a responsibility to God for the truth, to yourselves for the truth, to others for the truth, and you must stand. Um, Spurgeon said, every wreck ought to be a beacon 
one man's fall should be another man's warning. When we see people going off, maybe sometimes even people we care about and love, it should be a warning to us. Um, boy, I never thought that person would do that or believe that or think that. I've lived, lived long enough to see many friends and some people who've been in this church in years past or some people I was in seminary with, they're way off the beam from where they were. And Spurgeon's certainly right. Every wreck ought to take, uh, be up to be a beacon. One man's fall should be another man's warning. Not too long ago, I don't remember when, because we've had so many Bible conferences, they all kind of mold together to me. But I was coming back, and I don't think Linda was with me for some reason. I think I was by myself. She might have been with me, I don't remember. But I do remember we were driving back and trying to get back uh, to Athens from the conference on a Saturday night. And I started coming through Canton. And they just had an ice storm. Now, when I went through Canton going up, there was no problem. But two days later, there was big problems. And as I started coming through Canton, I, I saw cars, trucks, everything in the median strip off to the side and slid on the ice. I bet I counted 50. And I slowed down. As soon as I saw that, I thought, I can't drive as if there's no ice on the road. I don't want to be like one of these people and get stuck here. And so I slowed down. Their mistakes, their problems were a warning to me. And I, I got through it. I got through it without wrecking my car or without doing a 360 or anything like that. Uh, in Spurgeon's statement, every wreck ought to be a beacon. One man's fall should be another man's warning. I'll tell you another one. This is Bill Hickson's. Our own falls should be a warning. For 13 years, I drove up to New Philadelphia and back when we started Grace Chapel up there. I did it. Every, I preach up here. Uh, one of the elders would preach Sunday night, and I'd get in the car and drive up there and preach and then drive back. And I learned from going on 77 from New Philadelphia to Cambridge that that was a particularly dangerous place uh, when it came to ice. And I learned it from my own mistake because I was going down through there. I thought I was going slow enough. It was snowy and icy, but I thought I was going slow enough. And I did a, I did a 360 in my car on the four lane. Fortunately, I didn't go into the median strip. I didn't go off to the side. I just stayed in the middle of the road. I did my 360, and I kept going. <laughs> I didn't end up in a wreck. <laughs> but you, you, you can be sure of this. I slowed down more than ever every time I drove that section between New Philadelphia and Cambridge. And I always found once I get past south of Cambridge, it wasn't as bad. There's a break in the, rever the weather right there. And if you had ice above Cambridge, that doesn't necessarily mean you had ice below Cambridge. But I learned something. I didn't say, oh, let's see. Did my 360. Uh, oh, I've only done that once. I, I don't have to worry about that again. No, hopefully, even with my dense head, I learned something. <laughs> so when Spurgeon said every wreck ought to be a beacon, one man's fall should be another man's warning. Our own falls should be our own warning when we mess up. And we, we, we got to remember those things. Now, having said that, one of the greatest falls we can make is to get focused on what's wrong and false Christianity and false teaching and people who've gone off and get focused so much on that and be a watchdog and never and forget to praise God and glorify God and enjoy God. If false teaching moves you into that area, 
and worship is diminished or dried up because you're so focused on fighting false teaching. You're doing exactly what Jude does not want you to do. At the end of this book, he focuses on evangelism. He focuses on ourselves to build up ourselves and our holy face, and he focuses on God. He does, in other words, even with false teaching, you don't just, all right, I'm watching the false teachers. No, no. You have a responsibility. Verse 20, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus to bring you to eternal life. So even where we're watching false teaching in others, we need to what? Build up ourselves, keep ourselves, or as Paul said to the Ephesian elders, take heed to yourself. You can't skip the end of the flock over which God's made you overseas. You can't get so busy with the flock that you forget yourself. You can't be so focused on false teachers arising from within or coming in from without. You forget yourself. And so that is very, very important. It's just kind of basic, isn't it? We have multiple and many duties. We must never forget those responsibilities. Some of us, when we're busy, we wish we wish life didn't have so much demands, make so many demands on us. And we think, I just got to cut out a a few things, and sometimes we do. I understand as we get older, I'm understanding that better. But there are some duties that must be continued. And we have to trim many things away as we get older, but one thing we must not trim away is the duties Job, I mean Jude mentions in this book. And one of those duties in fact, the primary duty is to always have a doxology, always being praise, always being able to praise God. The fact and presence of apostasy is never, ever, ever, no matter how bad it is or how extensive it is, is to diminish our worship, but instead increase it. And so... In verse 4, back in certain men, it didn't say a certain man. There were several that were going off, several who'd slipped in, several godless men, not a godless man, who were changing the grace of God into a license of immorality and denying Jesus Christ, our sovereign and our Lord. So it wasn't a singular false teacher. It was multiple false teachers. And... It's so easy to feel outnumbered and so easy to focus on the, the uh, preference of evil and the, and the power of evil and all the compromise that's happening and not keep focused on God. Jude deviated from his lesson plan, but not from his doxology. I'm going to write about the common salvation, but now I'm going to write contend for the faith. He deviated from his lesson, but he did not deviate from worship. He kept that in. That is extremely important. Charles Haddon Spurgeon certainly towered above many preachers of his day and ever since. I've read his autobiography, two-volume autobiography. I've read a few biographies on him and read many sermons from him. I admire the man. I thank God for him. He was unique. I couldn't be him in any way. But Spurgeon loved the last two verses of Jude. He loved it. We have three sermons from him on that text. 
And Spurgeon said, learn from this, dear friends, that the sin of man, if we are ever called to denounce it, should drive us to adore the goodness and glory of God. It's very easy, isn't it, if you're married, to get occupied with the sin of your family? For your family to get occupied with your sin? And think, well, if we could just fix that, everything would be great. It's very easy, isn't it, to get occupied with the sin in the church? Or in our time, the movements of the day, or the people that are trying to come in and try to turn the church somewhere else and not be occupied with our Lord. And if that happens, Satan is one. He's deviated us from our primary responsibility. Our primary responsibility is to worship the Lord. And from that worship, we're to work for the Lord and witness for the Lord. But if we don't worship for the Lord, our work is going to suffer and our witness is going to suffer. I hope we all get that, right? This is this is pretty basic Christianity 101, right? But it seems we have a problem with it. I'm going to continue to read what Spurgeon said. Sin defiles the world. So after you've done your best to sweep it out, resolve that inasmuch as man has dishonored the name of God, you will seek to magnify that name. It is true that you cannot actually redress the wrong that's been done. But at any rate, if the stream of sin has been increased, you may increase the stream of loyal and reverent praise. Take care that you do so. Jude is not satisfied with having rebuked the, the sons of men for their sin. So he turns around to glorify his God. Um, I think one, computers have done a lot of good things, but it's very easy to, and I've done this myself, you spend a lot of time on YouTube and, you, you, the, and the, one person's exposing a false teacher here, one's doing that here, and you, you see all this, all, you can get oh so occupied. Now in this, we need to have not less Bible, but more Bible, not less God-centered, more God-centered. And one writer said, there are few expensive seats in the gro growing theater of church growth. The seats have to be kept cheap because every attempt to raise the cost of discipleship sends, sends spiritual bargain hunters out shopping for installment plans. Faith with a... Faith, in the, in the, and that is what they want is faith with a low down payment. Calvin Miller. And so, you know, it seems like everything's dumbing down, right? And people just want a little Christianity and they don't want much Bible teaching. They don't want any responsibility of evangelism. They certainly don't want any negativity towards anyone. And the point is, I look at Jude in the last part of this book is we're to expect more of people, not less. We're to expect more of ourselves, not less. This is a call to arms, a call to witness, a call to edification, a call to worship. It's not all warfare. Warfare is there. But it's vital that God get the glory. It's vital that we become God-focused. We must not be caught up in warfare or witness to the place we can't worship. Have you ever come to church and your mind's spinning with some problem at home, or some problem at the job, or some problem in your own life, and you can't hardly sing the hymns because of that other things, you're getting diverted. Our God... Our God deserves all the glory from us. And, you know, when you kiss your wife, you don't want to be thinking about a problem. 
and be thinking about your wife. And so it, it's very important when we come to church, we need to be thinking about God. When we live our life every day, we need to be thinking of God. It's absolutely vital that God gets his glory. You can become apostate fighting apostasy. I believe you can become an apostate fighting apostasy. And so lift it up in your ability to discern and be right that you don't enjoy God anymore. And Satan's won. He's won. I see people doing that today. They're overoccupied with all the wrong in the government and in the world and all the conspiracies of this and that. And it's so shriveling. And I remember in my early ministry, people, there were different ministries that had, I called them dirt sheets. <laughs> but they would, this teacher's doing this wrong, and this pastor over here is this wrong, and that one's wrong. And often they were right about the exposure of this church or that issue. But there was nothing positive in that little magazine. And in the beginning, I thought, well, I'm thankful. I, I'm, get, I'm being informed, and I'm, I'm keeping up on this person and that person, and I need to do that, and I can just read this. But then I thought, as valid as that is, and I think a warning ministry is valid, it'd be very, very easy to get so occupied on exposing wrong of others, you don't enjoy the Lord. And I'm not saying that the ones I got were doing that. I don't know if they were or not but I know their publications were doing it. There wasn't much positive. Orthodoxy actually means, ortho means right or straight, and, and, and doxy means praise. Orthodoxy means right praise. We're to worship God in spirit and in truth. The whole point of orthodoxy is that God gets his praise properly, that we see him as we should, that we honor him as we should. We are here to praise God. Doxology is our purpose in this life and the next life. Without praise, we fall into self-centeredness. Without praise, life loses its proper focus. And without even knowing it, we begin to promote ourselves not only over others, but possibly even God himself, unthinking. Now, let's look at verse 24 of Jude. So Jude has very good, I think he wrote the whole book to, to deal with this, really, he was to deal with the false teachers, but he wanted them to deal with the false teachers um, in the right way and with the right focus. The doxology. To him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To him. We praise God or his ability in saving us. Times of apostasy should be times of soul searching. Is it I, Lord? All seeds of rebellion arise in the heart. I, I've been to the Grand Canyon once in my life. I was a probably about 12 years old. I've been trying to get back ever since. But one thing I confess, I don't think I would ever do is take a ride down the trail with a horse or a donkey that's about this wide. <laughs> I have no interest in doing that. And I know they say the horse is more sure-footed sure than you are. That doesn't give me very much encouragement. <laughs> 
I would love to see the bottom of the Grand Canyon, but not that. I might get on one of the rafts. I might do that. Well, when I was younger, I'd probably do it. Although Dr. Whitcomb did it when he was old. Might do that, but no way am I going to get one of those horses. Say that to Linda, because I've been wanting her to go there. And even if she goes, I'm not. <laughs> and so, kind of important. But thank God for his ability in saving us. Uh, I may not trust the donkey's ability, but I can certainly trust God's. And that Peter said, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, goodness, knowledge, and knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, and perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, uh, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. We are to get in the growth cycle because of what God has done for us. We can get on board. And the church dares not just trust good preaching and have bad living. We need God working in all of us. And it's that God who's already begun the work, who's already taking out the stains from the bride, and all of that just wants to present us without blame. To present you before his glorious presence without fault and without joy, with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, authority, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all, all, who age, all ages. Some may be terrified to meet Jesus. Uh, the great ability of our Lord in saving us and the great sovereignty of our Lord in saving us should encourage us for that day. I'm looking forward to when I'm going to be before the Lord because when I'm before the Lord, I'm going to be like the Lord. Yes, he may have a thing or two to say to me, I'm sure he will, about how I live, but I'm going to be like him. And I'm going to amen everything he says. I'm not going to question his uh, criticisms and say, well, that wasn't really that bad. Or, you didn't get it right. No, no, you're right. But I'm not that way now, and I'm now conformed to your image. And so Jude says, Jude says, uh, verse 25, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ray Brown is a Reformed theologian, and he said this, with reference to the claimed existence of any other God as the true God, I am not simply agnostic, I am a convinced atheist. In other words, I don't believe there's other gods out there than the God of the Bible. With reference to the claimed existence of any other God as the true God, I'm not simply an agnostic, I am a convinced atheist. I deny that any other God exists, and save as idolatrous creations in the minds of sinful men who've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And that a lot of apostasy starts getting into false ideas about God, right? And false gods. So we praise God for his ability in saving us. We praise God for his sovereignty in saving us. He is the only God. He's unique. All other gods, false gods, are products of wishful thinking and imaginations of fallen men. This God tells the future, Isaiah 44, 6 to 8. This God does miracles, Deuteronomy 4, 32. This God is real. He has a real existence outside of our minds. Now, the unbeliever thinks that your God and my God's only existence is in our mind. In their mind, he's a made-up God. The God of the Bible is a made-up God. He's made up by the men who wrote the Bible. He's made up by the, in the minds of those who believe the Bible. And uh, they don't believe our God is real. They have to believe that or they wouldn't be unbelievers. They couldn't go to sleep at night. 
And there are certainly many gods that have no real existence outside of the minds of men. All the pagan gods are that way. Galatians 4.8, he says, by nature, they're not gods. But our God is the true God. He has no competitors, and uh, we need to praise and glorify him. We appraise him for his ability to save us. <laughs> we praise him <laughs> sovereignty in saving us. And we praise him for his pro prodigality in saving us. Prodigal means wasteful or extravagant. He's extravagant in saving us. And it's all done by him. It's all done through him. And so may the Lord uh, help us to understand that. He is the true God. To him who's able to keep you from falling and prevent you before his glorious presence without fault, with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages. And we pray him for his nobility in saving us. What a rich revelation of the perfections of God in the work of redemption. God is certainly all of that. One Reformed theologian speaks about doxology. Doxology acknowledges that the revelation of God is, riches, is, is richer than any man-made system of thought. There isn't, one, <laughs> there isn't one theology that gets it all because we know in part, we prophesy in part. So, he has, God has unlimited majesty. God has unlimited dominion, unlimited authority. He's before all time. He's eternal. And we praise him. Now, that's not all we do. We do other things. Jude talks about evangelism. Jude talks about warning ministries. Jude talks about growing, being edified. That's not all we do. But in all we do, we praise him. We can't leave that out. We praise him for his ability to save, for his sovereignty in saving us, for his prodigality in saving us, and for his nobility in saving us. That's what this doxology is all about. You are, you are all of this in saving us. You could have been less than this, but you're not. It's pretty obvious that Jude has spent some time thinking and meditating and pondering on the greatness of God and the goodness of God in salvation. He was going to write about that. But he had to write about dealing with false teachers. But he's kind of coming back to that, right? Kind of coming back to that at the end of the letter. And I would have kind of liked to have whatever he said about salvation a little more. But what he says right here in the last verses in this doxology is probably enough or it would have been different. One, one pastor said, worship is based on meditation, and meditation is based on discovery. What is discovery? Uh, uh, discovery is based on, the, on time spent with God in prayer and in his word. I love commentaries. You know, I quote commentators. I've got a lot from them, and I'm so thankful uh, for them. But there's nothing I can discover in a commentary that's quite as thrilling as when I'm just alone in the Bible and I'm God taught. And God says, oh! <laughs> and you get the joy of God, the Holy Spirit, speaking to you, not like he spoke to the prophets, but speaking to you in illumination. Now I see. And if there's no discovery and no meditation, there will be no worship because there's no experience of God. God's just somebody we have heard about and read about. Our lives are about glorifying Him. Our church should be about what? Glorifying Him. Our ministry should be about what? Glorifying Him. When we reach in the fire and get somebody out, let's do... It's about what? Not just saving that person, but glorifying him. Every situation in our lives, everything should be in seen with that great purpose. 
glorifying him. Now, glorifying God's kind of complicated. God might put you through something very humbling, very hard. Okay, God, I guess I can glorify you by going through this and honoring you in it. That's not what I want, not what I expected. But every situation in life is seen in that in light of that great person purpose. So do we have a doxology? It comes right down to that. Do we have a doxology? Do we have, Jude had a doxology? He ended his book with a doxology, praising God. I know we get benedictions, we want praise, we want blessings to come down, but do we have doxology praise going up? And one of the most convicting verses in the Bible, my time's up, but is Acts 16 when Paul and his companion are thrown in bar, uh, who was it? Somebody else, uh, Silas, are thrown into prison. They're chained, they're bloodied, it's dark, it's midnight. And what are they doing? I know what I'd be doing. I'd be groaning. <laughs> I'd be saying to my the other guy, that really hurt. <laughs> Boy, that whip was hard. I'd probably be complaining a little bit and groaning. It, it, this is so unjust. What were they doing? They were singing praise to God. That's so convicting to me. So very convicting. They retained a doxology in the midst of a lot of injustice and a lot of cruelty and uh, so important. So let's, Spurgeon said, let's adore him who can keep us from falling. Let's adore him who is with, uh, with, present with us uh, and in, in our, in, to keep us faultless. Let us adore him with the highest description of praise. I'm done with one more quote. No, two more quotes, and I'm done. It's one of he's one of these theologians that I really like, although he had some serious faults. Robert Louis Dabney. Robert Louis Dabney was a reformed Southern Presbyterian reformed theologian, and he actually wrote with uh, Stonewall Jackson in the Civil War. He had one really big error, besides his eschatology and other stuff, was that he. He, he defended slavery. It was a big mark against him, in my opinion. But in so many ways, he was, he, he's a very powerful individual read and often says things very wonderfully. But when Dabney got older, he began to worry about his impending death. And he expressed his fears in a letter to a former student, C.R. Vaughn, who was also a Presbyterian, Southern Presbyterian. Dabney wondered about his ability to die honorably and hold on to his Christian faith. He didn't, wasn't, didn't care about dying. He just wanted to die honorably. Vaughn replied, Dear friend, let me advise you now as you often have me. If you were about to cross a deep chasm and there was a bridge over it, would you stand there looking at yourself, wondering if you trusted enough in bridges to be able to cross? Or... Would you not rather go and examine the beams and timbers of the bridge and the quality of its construction and determine whether the bridge were trustworthy and then pass over it in confidence? Our faith is in Christ. Spend yourself focusing on him and his sufficiency rather than yourself. So when our time to go, may we say, Lord, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to enjoy you and I'm going to glorify you. One other old writer wrote this, O happy saints who dwell in light and walk with Jesus clothed in white, safe landed on that peaceful shore where pilgrims meet to part no more. Released from sin and toil and grief, death was their gate to endless life, an open cage to let them fly and build their happy nest on high. And now they range the heavenly plains and sing their hymns in melting strains. And now their souls begin to prove the heights and depths of Jesus' love. Ah, oh, Lord, with tardy steps I creep and sometimes sing and sometimes weep, yet strip me of this house of clay and I will sing as loud as they. <laughs> Father, thank you for the doxology of the book of Jude. May our life always, always have a doxology. In the hardest, difficult times of our life, may we say, praise God, 
from whom all blessings flow. In his name we pray. Amen. Lord, as we go from this place, loving you more, trusting you more, may the power of your love and the light of your word shine forth to a sin darkened world as we go from this.